Cyborg Alpha, Infinite Tween in Middle School for Life. Well, it is 23 hours and 27 minutes uh, into the 29th day of November, 2021. And we're sitting outside in the cold again. This is a picture of uh, what I'm looking at. And uh, in the uh, few seconds or so, I'll turn this around. And uh, we'll begin our discussion tonight, our uh, observation vlog. And tonight's title is going to be, this is sort of the top of the general topic, defining white, defining white in terms of white people, uh, pre-Europe, pre-Europe, Gaul, and the ancient world. So we're going into that. This is going to be a rather complex uh, verbal essay. And it's more than likely going to have to be done in parts. So this is going to be first of, of many parts. So, But the thing is, because it's not an organized essay in terms of being formal, it's this is the draft version of it. This is how things emerge from the notes. Uh, there isn't going to be uh, an announcement of first part, second part, and so on and so forth. It has, you have to go back over these things again to hear extra things. And then, of course, the uh, other verbal essays, as we, as we continue on with the, the, uh, uh, the observation vlog, they'll contain other components of this. This is how the parts will be done out. Well, as I said, uh, we're doing the, you know, the sort of the history... We're trying to define what the white people are, because this has become such an issue, particularly to the members of ADOS. I'm doing this for the members of ADOS, the American dependents, uh, the American dependents of slave of of uh, slaves, and they have with Yvette Carnell the discussion of uh, reparations. But the thing is, they don't seem to understand. Uh, you know, they are sort of dedicated to larger governments. They say, oh, governments do indeed work. But they never have in history. And so let's get into the history of why governments typically ignore the average person. And to understand this in their current situation, because we are living in a European world, we're living in a, we call a white world, even though uh, it's in, in many ways, it's in its descendancy. The Western world is ending. This is what's happening now. The Western world is ending. And there are a lot of people out there who are sort of trying to sort of see where they can make their place in this because uh, it's going to affect a lot of people in a lot of very negative ways. So let's begin this and understand that the white world that we see today that we talk about in terms of racism, so on and so forth, only existed from the eighteen from about the 1800s. There was no, if you will, white world before then. Uh, this was a world of kingdom states, uh, a world, world where uh, slavery had nothing to do with uh, color or race. It really depended on where you were in the structure of class that you were in. Uh, now that this is what I talked about, the vassal state, the vassal uh, kings. The uh, Of course, every vassal king had a vassal court, right? In the court, you had the vassal government. And, each, and so you had vassal, vassal at, at all different levels. It wasn't just at one level you had a vassal. You had vassals all the way down, anything connected to the state, because uh, the state itself was initially a vassal. Uh, that's when you really sort of had uh, a, 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 the sort of called vassal, vassal system, and you, you would get all the way down to the local sheriff uh, and, and the mayor himself, the lord mayor, then he was uh, he was picked from amongst the people uh, to be uh, the king's representative, to be the representative of the throne. And he was given power uh, to sort of rule the in particular area, the city, uh, with his own authority. He was given. He was given. That's where the sheriff comes in. The sheriff comes in because he is the he is the sort of or the enforcer. The Security for the uh, for, for the mayoral system. So we have the mayoral the mayoral system forms a level of government. That's your va again another another level of vassal state to protect their interests and keep themselves in power. They have the sheriff to do their bidding. The sheriff 
and the police are their fundament, fun, are fundamentally their dogs. And so this is how the, these things function. Uh, and the thing is, if you go into, you have to go before 1800, once you start understanding the 1800s, uh, before you get before the 1800s, it breaks up into, and the vassal states are still there. Uh, this is what you would know as the feudal system. You have to study the feudal, the feudal system. Because the feudal system is based on the vicarage. You look at the vicarage, look at vicar. Uh, and these are the levels of, of uh stature in society again once again majority of them are vassals they're not there as any form of power they're simply vassal. They have a fragment of the power from the throne the throne always contains the power and this is where your elites are your elites are the throne it really depends on how the elite ascended to the throne this will determine how the elite will fundamentally behave but the ones they all have, they all have some to some degree or another. Their the rise to the power, the rise to the top, the rise to the throne, is always with some form of Faustian bargain. In other words, you'd have to look up the, the, the you'd have to learn, look up the term Faust, and it's actually a name, and then go in and find out who the character Faust was. And then you'll be have a be sort of be, have an understanding of how this all sort of comes into play. And the thing is, that what happens once you start, and I don't, I'm using the term, I'm using Faust there for a, a number of reasons, because I don't want to get into talking about Masons and, and, and Masonic rites, because the Masons and Masonic rite are kind of a smokescreen. It's a fragment of what, it's a fragment of what is there actually there, and there's actually beneath the, the Masonic understanding. And you want to get at the whole thing. The, the Masons have all these levels of of existences, including the guys who are riding the gold carts. Ugh. Go out to a parade and you see these little guys in funny hats uh, driving around these gold carts or, or these tiny little cars. Well, not, these are the people who are part of the Masonic Lodge. And they, this Masonic Lodge, for the average person, is nothing more than a club for gentlemen. You know, and I think, think they've gotten is they brought in some women now. You know, women have their own clubs and stuff and so on and so forth, but Fundamentally, they're for men. They're based on the brotherhood. They're based on, actually, ironically, they're based on monasticism. Monasticism. They're monks. This is the nature of the lodge. This is why they were all men. Is that they were basically founded uh, on the principles and structures of a monastery. Now, I don't see any reason why you couldn't have a convent, which would be all women, but uh, I've never really sort of seen that uh, in, in this Sort of sense, uh, but the thing is, is that at that level, you're you're, you're at the lowest levels, and that's not where we want to be. We want to be at the higher levels, and the higher levels are, are are more along the lines of Faust. Faust com covers a larger chunk of area in terms of uh, the hidden and unseen. In terms of why does someone do what they do? Why do these elites behave the way they behave? Why do the celebrities do what they're doing? Well, it's, a, it's an issue of Faust. All these people, these people who have this, you know, those, this sort of prince and princess attitude type of things, their, their, their existence is above others. This is a this is a Faust issue. This is has a lot to do with Faust and understanding what Faust is. And so this is why the term is being used. But again, it's something that has to be researched. It's not. And then the the research is not something that happens overnight. It's not happened. It takes uh, like some of the stuff I'll be talking about in a bit, and even a little now, uh, getting into some of these different structures it has to do with the fact that I'm some of the, some of the stuff I just picked up some really good stuff over the weekend, and as reading through this stuff, reading through this information, uh, that I come to very uh, come to the conclusions. It, what it does, the, what I found solidifies my understanding of what I already understood. In other words, you have an understanding. Again, you don't get the entire thing. And something comes along and gives you a better understanding. That's what happened this weekend. I found two pieces of information. This was after well, close to six, to six to seven hours of sort of, sort of perusing around, looking at different things. Uh, I found two significant pieces that... Uh, 
help me better understand the what called the, the, the situation we call a Gnostic situation or a Faust situation. Those are the two terms, Faust and Gnostic. And what happens, I need to understand is in this situation with Faust or Gnostic, the appearance is not necessarily what they are. In other words, they will have an appearance of being good, but they're not necessarily good. They're actually, in many cases, they're evil. And this is where you, this is where you sort of now bring in Hegel, uh, because Hegel sort of sits at a point uh, in the in the sort of getting close to the racist era, uh, to the 1800s, but it's still well before the 1700s. Uh, Hegel brings in a concept of something called the Hegelian dialectic, that a, you have a synth a thesis. You have the antithesis, the, the op opposition, and the battle between the two produces a synthesis. And that synth synthesis is progress. And this is what we define today, and this you'll find this in Karl Marx, you'll find this in a number of documents that talk about how do you produce a progress within society. Well, this is this is that particular, but this is this understanding being brought forward in other terms. So Hegel becomes the point that you have the emergence of the, the concept of progressivism. The, the progressive term emerges from Hegel. The progressives themselves, actually in, in terms of the nature of humanism, emerge themselves from Voltaire. Now, at this point in time, with Voltaire coming in, this is where you have a solidification of science. Science starts to come together, particularly around the 1800s. And you have a perspective that they know everything there is to know. This is where, this is where Lionel, Lionel comes in because he's a modernist. The modernists believe that there is no God or no need for a God and that human beings can be uh, well-structured on their own, that this, is, that this is, you have these so-called natural laws. But, but the problem is most, and this, this idea was at the time very dangerous because the control, there was no humanist control in the world. All of your kings and queens understood this perfectly and they understood that this was not part of the Faustian bargain. This was not part of the deal that they had to maintain a deal with the Faust issue along the Faustian lines. And this is the way they behave. And so what happens is that oh, they say, okay, well, Voltaire, you, you're producing stuff that's not within the narrative, if you will. Uh, <laughs> because again, they created this narrative uh, so, so, so that the kings, would be, the kings and queens would be ordained by God. This is a, a mystical thing. This is where you get the Faustian bargain, because God is it again needs to be further defined. It's not simply oh, it's just one God. No, there's there's a further definition there, a further need for definition, and this is what brings you into a, a sort of a larger sense of research is is understanding that within Faust, within within the Faustian bargain, and this produces your kings and queens, your 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 define your divinely. Ascent, divinely chosen. In other words, the kings and queens are not chosen by happenstance. They're not there on a sort of a evolutionary scale. They are off the evolution. These are people who are born uh, and ordained by God as such to carry the mantle of leadership. You know, born to leadership. This wasn't a, this wasn't sort of a chance. This was uh, a, the working of a higher order. And so this is where a large chunk of this Faustian stuff comes in. This is where you have the Gnostic stuff coming in. Because this is what Gnost the Gnostics, the Faustian uh, issues, all deal with the higher knowledge, the higher being that controls everything. And what happens is that they sit there in this belief that they are at the top because God put them there. Of course, everyone else is down below them. And so they need that... They, to protect themselves, they need that. That's why the vassal state is created. The, the vassal state is created, and and 
That's the narrative, creating the, the, the vassal state. So that the people are controlled but never see the reality of what the kings and queens are. But here comes along a guy, Voltaire, and says, oh, I want to show you what everything is, and that everybody, you know, that this is a Gnostic thing, that there is no God, there is no, it's all magic, it's all this and that, you know. He's going to toss everything out the window. Uh, but the problem is, is that Voltaire doesn't know the mathematics, he doesn't know the science, and most of the scientists, most of your mathematics, in order to calculate the magic, uh, they, this is where most of your ma- this is where your, most of your mathematics comes from, including including physics. Newton, who sits at the core of, of, of what we understand as physics, Newton was a Gnostic. He was he was a he was a uh, alchemist. Same thing with Leibniz. They were working on they were working on mystical documents they were receiving, but because of all these documents and this is where the Da Vinci Code comes in from, all these documents that were done in code, they were coded. And so in order to understand the code, they had to work on, they had to use advanced forms of mathematics. This is calculus. This is what they brought forward. As they brought forward the physics and the science, uh, they also brought forward mathematics, which is calculus. This was all done to understand the hidden uh, uh, codes within these texts that they received. And this is, of course, the, 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 this is what Fibonacci had been working on. And the Fibonacci stuff, the work that Fibonacci had been doing, uh, this is what Da Vinci picked up. And so, of course, Everyone else picked it up from him, saying that there's a Da Vinci code. There's, there's stuff hidden within this particular art, this particular work, or, 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 or writing, or whatever. That ha- there's a hidden code that you can predict things. And this a large chunk of where this went came from. Uh, a large chunk of your genetics was in that form. A hidden code that would determine everything that you could predict things with it. And the thing is, is about the Voltaire sort of kind of jump ship early. And he got caught by the uh, by the, the royal societies, but what happens? These royal societies, you had people within the royal societies who were agents of chaos. In other words, it was their job, their belief that in order to properly create progress, you had to create chaos first. That order, structure, and progress came out of chaos. This, is, ironically enough, is a document that I recently found, picked that up, and it comes from a good rabbinical source. This rabbinical source is deep within uh, uh, the orders of Judaica, and there's a lot of orders to Judaica, including, if you want to get some understanding of where we're talking about, you have to look up the term Sephardic Jew, and you have to look up the the term Hasidic Jew, and understand what the two things mean. And once you understand that, then you begin to understand that there's a lot more behind everything than you actually think there is. And there's this document that describes how these rabbis who were hidden within Judaism, and most rabbis have no, most rabbis and most Jewish people have no idea that they're there. These people are hidden, they're well hidden. And this is the nature of Kabbalah, the, or the original nature of Kabbalah. What you see in the public eye is no long, is not real Kabbalah. It's a, it's a pretense, it's, a, it's a, a fiction, it's a work to hide the real stuff that's behind the scenes. And I think that it, there, Europe emerges from this uh, sort of world of Judaica. And this is why you have the Ju- Judeo-Christians. The Judeo-Christians do not refer to the original Christ. They refer to the hidden Kabbalah sect. The sect. This is where the Judeo-Christian ethics come out of. This is where you have the Judeo system coming into there. And you also have this also, because it's all Abrahamic, that when they talk about uh, Abraham, you go look into the uh, sources for uh, Sunni Islam and Shia Islam, and you begin to see the, the same thing is there as well. And it's fundamentally a belief that order comes out of chaos. That in order to have progress, you need to have chaos. So look, you have these real rabbis going in there and stirring the pot, as they say. Right? You want to make soup, you need to stir the pot. You need to agitate things, move things around so that you have the homogeneous, the heterogeneous system, because if something's heterogeneous and not homogeneous, the heterogeneous stuff, number of multiple parts, and you can sort of see this. You go to go go, uh, go uh, have a drink of juice, right? Uh, this is from a concentrate or something like that. What happens, you notice that, the, that, the, that the, the, there's a separation between, there's a heavier stuff on the bottom in terms of the juice, and there's a, the water near the top. 
Oh, what do you do? You mix it up. You shake it around so that the heterogeneous becomes homogeneous. Oh, this is what's going on. This is what's happening now. This whole, all the fighting and everything, like all the conflict, the arguing back and forth. This is the chaos. This is the shaking up of the mix to create a homogeneous progress, the, the one world, the single world, the new world order. This none of, none of this stuff has to do with racism. At this point, I've never I haven't, I haven't begun talking about racism because it's all about classes, where you place within the structure and order. But the thing is, most people, if you're not part of the vassal system, like Fifi, like Fifi Richards or or, or Fee, uh, Felicia Richard, which was initially Fifi Richards, that would be her that would be her ghetto ghetto name. But she's been gentrified. She's been brought up into the vassal state. And this is why she's protecting the members of Howard University who are also part of the vassal state. Howard University, your standard university, even though they're historically black, are there to create people who will enter the vassal system. They're, this is what they support. This is what they're about. They don't give you independent thinking. No university gives you independent thinking. In the university is designed to create an, an academic mindset and to think in very specific terms. It is a shaping. It is a work. It is a creation. It is a narrative. And what happens? Racism is part of this narrative. The more they can keep people fighting to each other, with, fighting with each other, the better. Because you have more. The more chaos you have, the more progress you're going to get. This is their view. This is what they believe in. This is what Bill Gates believes in. Because he now. He's no longer at the bottom. He's now at the top. He's now part of the, the elite structure. He's part of the uh, king, king, uh, kingdom system. He's been exposed. He's more than likely been exposed, enough exposed to the Faustian issues, the Gnostic issues, that he understands what's going on. He understands the, the structure of the elite, the uh, elected few, the Illuminati, the, the, the ordained kings and queens. He understands the imperial system, that the imperial system needs a vassal state. And this is what, the, this is what they're doing. What are they doing? They're creating the, they're creating the vassal state. They're getting, and the vassal state is now being organized. You have the police, you have this, and you have that. And why? Why are these people all doing what they're doing? Because they've got, they've got jobs, they're getting money, and they have houses, they have wives, they have children. You want to keep that, that uh, nice house you have. You want to keep your wives and children. You don't, want, you don't want to end up on the street, do you? Oh, I don't know. So then you do your job. What's your job? Protect your own self-interest. Keep yourself employed. So it doesn't matter if, you, if someone's if someone's giving you from above your authority, your your authority figure above you. This was done. This was uh, uh, Stanley Milgram. Stanley Milgram pr produced an experiment like this to f see how far people under an authority will go. And ironically enough, they used a teacher system where the the the, the you had the main teacher, the, the like the principal, and then you had another teacher. And you had a victim on the inside. Well, they had all been set up on stage, but they wanted to sort of see how far people would go. And most people would push the button in terms of this was, this was sort of negative conditioning using electric shocks. And they had on the board there, the, the, the person was sort of pressing the button to him. You hear the bang, bang, and every time you would, you would press and shock the person, you would have, hear, you'd hear you yelling a scream, oh, oh, you're hurting me, you're hurting me. Right? And as long as the teacher looked to his authority people and said, don't worry about it, we'll take care of it. They went further and further. Even the point they said, oh, oh, I'm having a heart attack. I've got a heart condition. You can't go that high. Dun, dun. And it was, what they were doing as well, at near the end, when they were at the highest voltage, they were giving people, the teacher, the wrong answers. To force the person who's being shocked to, to repeat the wrong answer. In other words, they're using negative conditioning. Instead of teaching something that was good, they're teaching them something was bad, something was false. In other words, creating the false narrative. And why did the people believe it? Because they didn't want the pain. And th th this was this is what set up again. It, this had nothing to do with race. Race wasn't even part of the equation at the time. This was in the 1950s. This, these are the people who designed a large chunk of the PR, the television, 
a lot of the things that we see today that sort of creates our global view of things, our worldview of things, uh, including our school system. This is the way everything was sort of set up. Everything was tested. And it came out of these, it came out of these, these sort of uh, psychological operations programs. Uh, everyone now talks about uh, MK Ultra in terms of the conspiracy theories, but there's a lot more there. All these programs that I was talking about, Stanley Milgram, uh, Stanford Prison Experiment, which, which showed why you have police abuse. You want to understand why police, police abuse is there? Go look at Stan, uh, a Stanford ex, a Prison Experiment. It's all there. Everything you talk about, everything you see in the streets with the, with, the, with, the, with the cops shooting black people, it's all there. The whole BLM issue is there with the Stanford University Prison Experiment. This was done in 1970. They have known about this since 1970. So where's the issue? The issue isn't with the president. It's not with the governor. It's with the municipal people. The, your mayor controls the police. It, it controls uh, how the police are actually trained. And this is part of the reality. And so what happens is, oh, this is about race. No, it's not about race. A large chunk of the papers, I mean, when it won't, won't, oh, the papers are in league with the, the CIA. We know because of Operation Mockingbird. No, go look into the history of the CIA. Go look into the history of the BBC. You'll find that the, that the media has always been, always been part of the intelligence apparatus. Go study Edward Bernays, and you'll find a large chunk of the reporters that were put into various different papers and so on and so forth. These are all PR people. They're there to create a narrative. So a large chunk of the work of the world you see is not specifically real, it's a created reality. And a large, this is where this this program and I get into a lot of trouble because well I don't believe in I don't believe in violence. I'm not a violent person. Uh, and I don't think violence is the solution. I am anti establishment. I don't like governments. And the only re- as I said before, the only reason why I re- vote Republican is because f- from what I've seen so far, the Republicans don't do what the Democrats do. They don't use people. They don't create causes. They go into a uh, their school that they don't want you around. I, I mean, I'm fine with. That. I don't have to be inclusive. If you want to go into your country club and you lock me out, fine. I don't want to be there anyways. I have my own world. I have my own life. I don't need them. But the thing is, the Democrats and the liberals have this particular particular view that they everyone has to be inclusive. And the thing is, their terms of inclusion is on their terms. You're included in the Democratic, this whole thing of diversity, as long as you agree with their particular points of view. As soon as you disagree with their points of view, you're banned, you're dangerous, you're, you're now anti-vax, you are uh, anti-trans or transphobic. They have tons of words to attack you with. And if it doesn't work to their narrative, you see that they're not, you're not exactly that, that doesn't matter. They'll lie. They'll make something up. This is the reality of what's going on. You see this in history, that, that this has always been the case. And the thing is, this is where we have to get into for, for the next, uh, next uh, tomorrow night. We'll get into the history of piracy to understand that a large chunk of your slave trading was done through the pirates. And this is why, in terms of ADOS, why are the Jamaicans including themselves? Well, they're not, they're not sh- as, as Yvette would say, they're not, sh- they're not shoehorning in. Your slaves, the, 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 the patterns of wind that bring ships, sailing ships from Europe to the United States, or to the Americas, actually, that's the most property of the Americas, it comes from off the coast of Spain, across the uh, Atlantic Ocean, through the, and through the Caribbean. So your Caribbean was the first stopping point. This is why Christopher Columbus didn't start, didn't discover North America. He discovered the Americas. Where did he land? He landed in Cuba. He didn't land in North America. He didn't find the North American Indians. It was Cuba. That's where he landed. It was the Mayflower, and this is where people make sense. It's the Mayflower that came later on uh, that brought the pilgrims over. They're the ones who landed in, in, in uh, uh, at Plymouth. Uh, that's in Mass- Boston, Massachusetts. 
they actually have the they have the place where they landed. There's a whole museum built around it. And so that's a different thing. So the Columbus had nothing to do with the wiping out of the Indians. It had to do with he 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 was doing a sort of brought trade back and forth between uh, between uh, Europe and 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 and, uh, and South. It was mostly South America at this time. Most of the work was done in South America, and this is where a lot of the gold was coming from. And so the English got involved with, uh, after the French got involved and realized there was a lot of gold coming out of that. So they, what they did, instead of, instead of creating an army to go in and take the gold, they, created, they, they, they made an agreement with, these, uh, with the Irish, ironically enough, uh, who were good navigators. The Irish were terrific navigators. Even though they were at the bottom, this is the, this is the problem with, the, with these vassal states. They found people at the bottom who were very good at things that they needed. And the Irish were excellent and excellent navigators. So they gave them ships, warships, English warships, and this, and they became the pirates. They were the privateers. Well, why do you hear that one of the pirates are like, ar, ar. It's not ar, it's the Irish, I, I, I. That's what it is. It's not ar, it's I. It's, and again, it's the Irish inflection, the Irish accent in the language. And that's where you had the first slaves coming in. The first slaves that came in were from, from, from Cuba and Jamaica and, and, and the Caribbean islands because those were the pirate islands. And then they were brought into the United States. This is why you have a lot of the southern states having the, having the plantations there because they came in from the Caribbean. Anyways, we're going to continue this tomorrow night because now we're getting into the Gnostics and the Gnostic understanding of these things. We are Cyborg Alpha, Infinite Queen in Middle School for Life.